Hello, friends. Thank you for joining our study. Uh, we will look at authoritative texts. Uh, of course, any comments are my personal interpretation. For any official or authoritative Baha'i teachings, please visit baha'i.org. Uh, I'd like to thank the Baha'i administration, as well as all of those working for peace. Uh, in the description below, you'll find timestamps of the various sections in this video, so you can jump to those sections if you like. Uh, there's also a link to download an audio form of this presentation, as well as a PDF with all of the quotes. So today we're going to be looking at an issue that comes out of the Islamic dispensation, and one of its concerns that might come up with the Baha'i Faith. Uh, this was particularly about a topic surrounding the point of adoration, or the Qibla, of the Baha'i world. So the Baha'is all over the world pray each day in their obligatory prayer, towards the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, the resting place of the Prophet Founder of the Baha'i Faith. Now, this may not seem peculiar to the Baha'is themselves, yet from an Islamic perspective, this seems rather odd. Um, within Islam, you actually cannot depict the Prophets of God. Uh, there is also within the Qur'an a very serious concern about the fixation or focus on the individual as opposed to the, if you will, the divine origin of the message itself. Uh, this is where the concept of shirk comes in, where there's a belief that we can associate partners with God. So from an Islamic perspective, when they see the Baha'is prostrating and praying towards uh, the shrine at Bahchi, which houses the remains of the Prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith, Baha'u'llah, this can seem very much like shirk. And I think that we have to remember that the depiction of any, if you will, image within Islam was something that was very prohibited. The anthropomorphization, the humanizing of God, uh, is something that is, if you will, anathema to the Islamic dispensation. It's important to add to this as well that the point of adoration, the focal center of the prayer of the Baha'is, actually moved throughout the lifetime of Baha'u'llah, and it was always where he was. Which again seems like a clear sign of shirk, or associating partners with God. And it's important to empathize with this point. Um, right before we go in uh, to the topic itself, there's one other issue I'd like to bring up, which is the concept of the Divine Assayer. We're going to start um, with a single quote uh, from the Qur'an, in Surah 4. O people of the Scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three, cease, it is better for you. God is only one God. Far is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. His is all that is in the heaven and all that is on the earth. And Allah is sufficient as defender. This quote's really important because um, to look at it from a Christian perspective. One, it's saying that Jesus was only a messenger. Second, not to say that he is one of three. God does not have a son. Now this is an issue we're going to have to take up in addressing Christian objections to the Islamic dispensation. I'm only using it here for, for empathy, to understand as a Muslim that when you come forward to a Christian and you're sharing your faith, say, with uh, the Christian, that they have things that they see within the Qur'an that are quite upsetting, that seem to go uh, contrary to what the New Testament itself said. It says that he's only a messenger, that God cannot have a son, and seems to be directly and overtly challenging the doctrine of the Trinity, while not universally held within Christendom, was a very, very prominent doctrine. Um, what would a Muslim in this case be doing? They would saying, be asking the Christian to hold on, to be patient, but to have a genuine and open conversation about this because Islam proclaims that the Qur'an itself was a fulfillment of Christian scripture. So the Muslim in this case is now going to have to be willing to empathize with the Christian that there is something within their holy book 
that does not seem to connect up or line up with the New Testament, and then ask for a richer, more deeper conversation about it. And it's something that we have to, I believe, we have to remember. That too often when we meet a worldview that does not immediately line up with our own, that we reject it out of hand. But rather we have to be seekers of truth. We have to be independent investigators and not simply turn to our own you know, learned of our community. This same principle applies all the way back to a Christian who is speaking to a Jew. The Jewish expectations of the Messiah were very different from what they saw in the person of Jesus Christ. They were waiting for a conquering king. They were waiting for somebody who would promulgate the law of Moses. They were waiting for the coming of Elijah. And what from their perspective they got was a crucified itinerant teacher. So this is a principle that we'll be going into uh, much more in depth in the future. But for now, I wanted to actually really read a quote from the Quran itself on this topic. Do men think that they will be left alone on saying, we believe, and that they will not be tested? We did test those before them, and Allah will certainly know those who are true from those who are false. Here the Quran is saying, do you think that if you say that we believe that you're not going to be put to the proof, that you're not going to be tested? Another quote, and unto Allah leads straight the way. But there are ways that turn aside. If Allah had willed, He could have guided all of you. The Quran here is telling us that there are ways that lead away from God. And if God had wished, He could have guided everyone. And this is a principle we find within the Quran itself, that God could have made each of you one community. He could have made all humankind one community, but He tests humanity to allow them to come of their own free will. If Allah had so willed, He would have made you a single people. But His plan is to test you in what He has given you, so strive as in a race of all virtues. The goal of you all is to Allah. It is He that will show you the truth of the matters in which He dispute. As I said, uh, the Quran says God could have made humanity all one community. But he chose to test his followers. And it says here, so strive as in a race of virtues. So there's a race, if you will, a, a way to exercise one's inner being in drawing close to God. And that God has placed obstacles or tests or challenges in the path of the seeker, but that is for their own evolution. It's important to note that God obviously could have made any of his revelations entirely obvious. Um, I have here another quote from the Quran, chapter 26, verses 2 to 5. These are verses of the book that make things clear. It may be thou frettest thy soul with grief that they do not become believers. If such were our will, we could send down to them from the sky a sign to which they would bend their necks in humility. But there comes not to them a newly revealed message from the most gracious but they turn away therefrom. Once again, the Quran is saying that if it had been God's will, He could have sent a sign so that everyone immediately accepted. To enlighten us on this point, we turn to a quote from Baha'u'llah from the Book of Sur. Meditate profoundly that the secret of things unseen may be revealed to you, that you may inhale the sweetness of a spiritual and imperishable fragrance and that you may acknowledge the truth that from time immemorial even unto eternity, the Almighty hath tried and will continue to try His servants, so that light may be distinguished from darkness, truth from falsehood, right from wrong, guidance from error, happiness from misery, and roses from thorns, even as He hath revealed do men think when they say we believe that they shall be let alone and not be put to proof? This quote from the Book of Certitude says that there is a truth that we need to acknowledge, which is that from time immemorial, even unto eternity, the Almighty hath tried and will continue to try His servants. 
that tests are given to humankind to see if they can surmount them. And it actually quotes the Quran 29.2, to men think when they say we believe that they shall not be put to the proof. When we look at the world just generally, um, every facet of it testifies to this truth. That if we seek to become better artistically, be it in violin, in playing the guitar, in learning to paint, in learning to draw, that it takes striving. It truly, truly takes discipline and tenacity and focus in order for any human being to advance within the artistic world. If we want to advance intellectually, we actually have to, if you will, sweat, <laughs> and actually put in the time and go through things that at first are very, very difficult to understand, and just keep going until we begin to more deeply understand the subject at hand. If we want to understand chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, history, any facet of human intellectual endeavor, there is a price to pay. It is that there is a test in the cosmos itself for everything of worth, for everything of beauty, that if we wish to actually um, advance artistically or intellectually, but also emotionally, if we want to get to a place where the words of others or the situations around us in our life do not cause us to fall into anger or frustration or rage even, we actually have to cultivate our hearts. We have to cultivate our emotional stability, and that is only done through striving, through discipline and determination. This goes in every facet of life, and I really believe if anyone truly looks at the world in which they live, they're going to see that this is an abiding principle. Muscles only grow when they are put under pressure. Baha'u'llah also references the fact that God could have communicated completely openly to his children. They have even failed to perceive that were the signs of the manifestation of God in every age to appear in the visible realm, in accordance with the text of established traditions, none could possibly deny or turn away, nor would the blessed be distinguished from the miserable and the transgressor from the God-fearing. Once again, just as in the prior quote, that we have to have a means that light can be distinguished from darkness, that rose is from thorn, from truth from error, that there has to be a way that we, these can be separated and the, the free will of humanity can actually be preserved. But even here, God does not reveal his cause unto humankind in an undeniable sense, so as not to remove the principle of choice and the principle of striving. We can now begin to look at the principle of the changing of the Qibla, or the point of adoration, and ask maybe if this is a repeat test. Why do I say this? Because God tests mankind by changing his laws. And we can see this specifically because in the Islamic dispensation, the point of adoration, the point of prayer, was originally Jerusalem. And that that point of adoration, that focal point of prayer, was suddenly transferred to Mecca and was a test to the hearts and minds of the Muslims. We're going to read first here from uh, the Quran, chapter 2, verses 142 to 145. The fools among the people will say what hath turned them from the Qibla to which they were used to. Say, to Allah belong both east and west, he guideth whom he will to a way that is straight. Thus have we made of you an ummat, a community, justly balanced, that ye might be witness over the nations, and the messenger a witness over yourselves. And we appointed the Qibla to which thou wast used, only to test those who followed the messenger from those who would turn on their heels. Indeed, it was a change momentous, except to those guided by Allah. And never would Allah make your faith of no effect, for Allah is to all people most surely full of kindness, most merciful. We see the turning of thy face for guidance to the heavens. Now shall we turn thee to a Qibla that shall please thee. 
Turn then thy face in the direction of the sacred mosque. Wherever ye are, turn your faces in that direction. The people of the book know well that this is the truth from their Lord, nor is Allah unmindful of what they do. Even if thou wert to bring to the people of the book all the signs, they would not follow thy Qibla, nor art thou to follow theirs, nor indeed will they follow each other's Qibla. If thou, after the knowledge hath reached thee, were to follow their desires, then wert thou indeed clearly in the wrong. This is the case where in the Qur'an actually the point of prayer, or the point of adoration, or the Qibla, was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca. And we're actually told by God <laughs> uh, in the Qur'an here why this was done. It's again, and I quote it, And we appointed the Qibla to which thou was used to, only to test those who followed the Messenger from those who would turn on their heels. So the point of adoration was transferred from Jerusalem to Mecca as a test to mankind, to separate between those who were truly following the Prophet or those who would turn away. I'll now read a longer passage, again from the Book of Certitude, which specifically deals with this issue. And likewise, reflect upon the revealed verses concerning the Qibla. When Muhammad, the son of prophethood, had fled from the day spring of Batha unto Yathrib, from Mecca unto Medina, he continued to turn his face while praying unto Jerusalem, the holy city, until the time when the Jews began to utter unseemly words against him, words which, if mentioned, would ill befit these pages and would weary the reader. Muhammad strongly resented these words, while wrapped in meditation and wonder, he was gazing towards heaven. He heard the kindly voice of Gabriel saying, We behold thee from above, turning thy face to heaven. But we will have thee turn to a Qibla which shall please thee. On a subsequent day, when the Prophet, together with his companions, was offering the noontide prayer, and had already performed two of the prescribed rakats, or prostrations, the voice of Gabriel was heard again. Turn thou thy face towards the sacred mosque. In the midst of that same prayer, Muhammad suddenly turned his face away from Jerusalem and faced the Kaaba, the center of Mecca. Whereupon a profound dismay seized suddenly the companions of the Prophet. Their faith was shaken severely. So great was their alarm that many of them, discontinuing their prayer, apostatized their faith. Verily God caused not this turmoil, but to test and prove his servants. Otherwise he, the ideal king, could easily have left the Qibla unchanged, and could have caused Jerusalem to remain the point of adoration unto his dispensation, thereby withholding not from that holy city the distinction of acceptance which had been conferred upon it. None of the many prophets sent down since Moses was made manifest as messengers of the word of God, such as David, Jesus, and others among the more exalted manifestations, who have appeared during the intervening period between the revelations of Moses and Muhammad, ever altered the law of Qibla. These messengers of the Lord of creation have, one and all, directed their peoples to turn under the same direction. In the eyes of God, the ideal king all the places of the earth are one and the same, excepting that place which, in the days of his manifestations, he doth appoint for a particular purpose, even as he hath revealed. The east and west are gods. Therefore, whichever way ye turn, there is the face of God. This again is from the quote of the Quran. Notwithstanding the truth of these facts, Allah continues, why should the Qibla have been changed? thus casting such dismay amongst the people, causing the companions of the Prophet to waver, and throwing so great a confusion into their midst. Yea, such things as throw consternation into the hearts of all men come to pass only that each soul may be tested by the touchstone of God, that the true may be known and distinguished from the false. Thus hath he revealed, after the breach amongst the people, we did not appoint that which thou wouldst have to be the Qibla, 
but that we might know him who followed the apostle from him who turneth on his heels. Again, a quote from the Quran. And then the quote continues, Affrighted asses fleeing from a lion. Returning to Baha'u'llah. When you would ponder but for a while these utterances in your heart, you would surely find the portals of understanding unlocked before your face, and would behold all knowledge and the mysteries thereof unveiled before your eyes. Such things take place only that the souls of men may develop and be delivered from the prison cage of self and desire. Otherwise, that ideal king hath throughout eternity been in his essence, independent of the comprehension of all beings, and will continue forever in his own being to be exalted above the adoration of every soul. A single breeze of his affluence doth suffice to adorn all mankind with a robe of wealth, and one drop out of the ocean of his bountiful grace is enough to confer upon all beings the glory of everlasting life. But inasmuch as the divine purpose hath decreed that the true should be known from the false, and the sun from the shadow, he hath therefore in ever season sent down upon mankind the showers of tests from his realm of glory. This quote from Baha'u'llah in the Book of Certitude is explicitly referencing and even quoting the quotes that we looked at above, that God tests his servants. Specifically, that when God changed the Qibla, the point of adoration or the point of prayer, from Jerusalem to Mecca, the Quran itself, and then Baha'u'llah points this out, specifically states that it is to test humankind. Now these tests aren't to trick. They're not meant to lead astray, but actually as we see through uh, the writings of Baha'u'llah himself, such things take place only that the souls of men may develop, right? That these, in, these obstacles and challenges placed in our way are that we can surmount our own limitations, that we can advance and evolve through the pressure of the tests that God has sent unto us. This next section, no change in his ways, Adam and Iblis. This was our way with the messengers we sent before thee. Thou wilt find no change in our ways. A second quote, Quran 2, 26-30. Allah disdains not to use the similitude of things lowest as well as highest. Those who believe know that it is the truth from their Lord, but those who reject faith say, What means Allah by this similitude? By it he causes many to stray, and many he leads into the straight path. But he causes not to stray except those who forsake the path. To pause for a moment, the Quran here is saying that it uses similitudes or symbols in order to lead people, but also to test people. Not that these are different similitudes or different metaphors or different tests. They are that which enables one to say, what could he mean by such a thing? While the other says, this is from our Lord. To continue, verse 27. Those who break Allah's covenant after it is ratified and who sunder what he has ordered to be joined and do mischief on the earth. These cause loss only to themselves. How can you reject the faith in Allah, seeing that you are without life and he gave you life? Then will he cause you to die and will again bring you to life, and again to him will ye return. It is he who hath created you, for you, all things that are on the earth. Moreover, his design comprehended the heavens, for he gave order and perfection to the seven firmaments, and of all things he hath perfect knowledge. Behold, thy Lord said to the angels, I will create a vicegerent on earth. They said, Will thou place therein one who will make mischief therein and shed blood? Whilst we do celebrate thy praises and glorify thy holy name. He, God, said, I know what ye know not. And he taught Adam the nature of all things. Then he placed bef them before the angels and said, Tell me the nature of these things if ye are right. They said, Glory be to thee. Of knowledge we have none save what thou hast taught us. In truth, 
It is thou who art perfect in knowledge and wisdom. He said, O Adam, tell them their natures. When he had told them, Allah said, Did I not tell you that I know the secrets of heaven and earth? And I know what ye reveal and what ye conceal. And behold, we said to the angels, Bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. Not so Iblis. He refused and was haughty. He was of those who reject faith. We said, O Adam, dwell thou and thy wife in the garden, and eat of the bountiful things therein, as ye will, but approach not this tree, or ye run into harm and transgression. Then did Satan make them slip from the garden, and get them out of the state of felicity into which they had been. We said, Get ye down all, with enmity between yourselves, on earth will be your dwelling place and your means of livelihood. Then learnt Adam from his Lord words of inspiration, and his Lord turned towards him, for he is oft returning most merciful. We said, Get ye down all from here, and if, as is sure, there comes to you guidance from me, whoever follows my guidance, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. For those who reject faith and belie our signs, they shall be companions of the fire, they shall abide therein. To summarize, what is this story telling us? This is the story of Iblis. God brings all the angels together. He then teaches all knowledge to Adam, the nature of all things. And then he brings them in front of all of the angels and tells all the angels of the heavenly realms to actually prostrate and bow down before Adam. All of them do except for one, Iblis. We're going to continue. <laughs> Keep this in mind, this picture, and we'll see it a couple of times. This is from Quran, chapter 18, verses 47 to 54. One day we shall remove the mountains, and thou wilt see the earth as a level stretch. And we shall gather them all together, nor shall we leave out any one of them. And then we be marshaled before thy Lord in ranks with the announcement, Now have you come to us as we created you first. I, he thought we shall not fulfill the appointment made to you to meet us. And the book will be placed before you, and thou wilt see the sinful in great terror because of what is recorded therein. They will say, Ah, woe to us, what a book is this. It leaves out nothing small or great, but takes account thereof. They will find all that they did placed before them, and not one will thy Lord treat with injustice. To pause for a moment, this is obviously discussing Judgment Day, the final day, when everybody will be gathered together. And it's interesting that a book will be placed in front of them. And that book will actually be the judgment of all the people. What comes immediately next is actually the story of Iblis. Verse 50. Behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. They bowed down except Iblis. He was one of the jinns, and he broke the command of his lord. Will you then take him and his progeny as protectors rather than me? And they are enemies to you. Evil would be the exchange for the wrongdoers. I called them not to witness the creation of the heavens and the earth, nor even their own creation, nor is it for helpers such as me to take as lead men astray. One day he will say, Call on those whom you thought to be my partners, and they will call on them, but they will not listen to them. And we shall make for them a place of common perdition. And the sinful shall see the fire and apprehend that they have to fall therein. No means will they find to turn away therefrom. We have explained in detail in this Quran for the benefit of mankind every kind of similitude, but man is in most things contentious. What I find really fascinating about the quote here is that it begins with Judgment Day and it ends with Judgment Day. I took out no verses in the passage. It starts discussing how Judgment Day will come, how people will be gathered and some book will be placed in front of them. Then suddenly it tells the story again of Iblis, that God brought Adam and asked all the beings of the angelic realm to prostrate before Adam, but one of them refused. An intriguing facet of this quote is that the story of Iblis, as we see in other parts of the Quran, is actually nestled uh, amongst a series of quotes regarding the Day of Judgment. 
which at least on the surface seems to allude that this has some relationship to the Day of Judgment itself. Another major point surrounding this quote is that, is God committing shirk? Is God, in asking all of the angelic hosts to prostrate and bow before Adam, when he's there, himself associating a partner with himself? I think the answer is obviously no. The reason why the angels must bow before Adam within this context is because it itself is a command of God. In some sense, we can see this symbolically as if heaven is the masjid, the mosque. And in this case, the prophet Adam is himself the Kaaba of all those within the angelic realm. So if this is nestled within the context of the Day of Judgment, as it is in other sections of the Qur'an, I myself would ask, is this facet of the prostration towards a prophetic figure actually itself linked with the Day of Judgment? Which might in fact actually flip this whole question to be seen as, as the Baha'i Faith claims, that this is the Day of God, that this is actually what is supposed to happen in this day, when the Kaaba gets shifted, as it did in the beginning, to a prophetic figure in the final day. In addition, just as the initial shifting of the Kaaba from Jerusalem to Mecca, here the return of the Kaaba, if you will, the Qibla, the point of adoration, being shifted to a prophetic figure is in some sense a test of the Iblis in us. Uh, again from the Quran, this is from chapter 7 verses 8 to 18. The balance that day will be true. Those whose scale of good will be heavy will prosper. Those whose scale will be light will be their souls in perdition, for that they wrongfully treated our signs. It is we who have placed you with authority on earth and provided you therein with means for the fulfillment of your life, small are the thanks ye give. It is we who created you and gave you shape, then we bade the angels bow down to Adam, and they bowed down, not so Iblis. He refused to be one of those who bow down. Allah said, What prevented thee from bowing down when I commanded thee? He said, I am better than he. Thou dost create me from fire and him from clay. Allah said, Get thee down from this. It is not for thee to be arrogant here, get out, for thou art the meanest of creatures. He said, Give me respite till the day when they are raised up. Allah said, Be thou among those who have respite. He said, Because thou hast thrown me out of the way, lo, I will lie in wait for them on thy straight way. Then will I assault them from before them, and behind them from their right and their left, nor wilt thou found in most of them gratitude. Allah said, Get out from this disgraced and expelled, if any of them follow thee, hell will I fill with you all. So once again here we have the story of Iblis. The fact that he refuses to actually bow down and prostrate towards Adam, the prophet, because of his arrogance, claiming that he himself is better than Adam. What is interesting again here is that Satan Iblis, in this case, is given respite until the end. He is given, if you will, a time out <laughs> until the final day when they will be raised up. And again, I would suggest it's very intriguing because in my own mind it seems to allude to the fact that this test will be replayed once again, when Iblis will once again be tested as humanity will be tested. Is it possible that this is referring to, once again, a prophetic figure being the point of adoration? Another facet comes up, because we've looked at um, that we shall see no change in the ways of God. So the question is, if in fact God in the past, within the Quran, has commanded all of the heavenly realms to prostrate before a prophetic figure, in this case Adam, shall we say that he could never do such a thing again? This is a quote from Abdu'l-Baha. 
Shall we then say that God has performed a certain thing, and he will never be able to perform it again? This is from the promulgation of universal peace. Alluding to a quote from the Quran, are we to say that God's hands are chained up? Given we know that this is an MO, a method of operation of the divine being, and that he tests his servants, can we genuinely state that it is impossible that such a thing would happen again? I suggest no. So Iblis considered himself greater than humankind. We actually have the reasons that Iblis gives to God for why he refused to prostrate. Uh, Quran, or, uh, chapter 15, verse 33, I am not one to prostrate myself to man, whom thou didst create from sounding clay, from mud molded into shape. The Quran, 1761, Shall I bow down to one whom thou didst create from clay? 38, chapter 38, verse 76, I am better than he, Thou createdst me from fire, and him thou createdst from clay. Quran, chapter 7, verse 12. I am better than he. Thou didst create me from fire, and him from clay. So in this case, was God's command for the host of angels to bow down before a form of clay? Was he, uh, God, commanding idolatry in such a case? Was he committing shirk? Once again, no. This was the command of God that they prostrate before a prophetic figure, and only one refused, Iblis, because of his arrogance. Obviously, in this case, God is not commanding idolatry. God, when he commanded all of the angelic hosts to prostrate before Adam, was not putting him up as a partner of his own to be worshipped instead of him. It was the means of worshipping the spirit, I suggest, that God had breathed into Adam as his messenger, for he knew the names of all things. He was the fount of knowledge, the manifestation of God. This concept of prostrating before stones, in this case the, the Kaaba in Mecca, no Muslim would actually claim that they themselves are prostrating and bowing to a cube of stone. Uh, this came home really when I, my wife and I lived in Yemen, and we would be talking with our students. This is Yemen, south of Saudi Arabia. So all of our students were Muslim, and we were talking one day uh, about different religions. And they uh, stated that actually, well, you know, there are these people, you know, say the Buddhists or the Hindus or even the Christians, who will actually bow down and pray to a figure, a physical figure that they have formed. And I said, yes, it's very strange. <laughs> it's a very odd practice. I know this other community where five times a day, the entire community worldwide actually worships a rock cube. Of course, <laughs> uh, this brought uh, a retort. No, teacher, this isn't actually what uh, Muslims do. It is merely a symbol. It is merely a point of focus to demonstrate the unity and the obeisance and submission to God's command. And I said, yes, like within other faiths. Um, it's not that actually a Buddhist is worshipping the statue itself, but seeing that, if you will, as a focal point right, for their devotion, a way to fix their mind upon the Buddha himself, for example. Now, this is important because on the surface, many people might have misunderstood Islam to be having as their point of adoration a stone itself, which is not the case. But just as that is the case in Islam, in the Baha'i faith it is not a worship of the physical temple of Baha'u'llah, it is an acknowledgement that this has been the mouthpiece of God unto humanity, communicating His will and His love to humankind. And given that we believe as Baha'is, that Baha'u'llah is the messenger of God, um, we are being obedient as having uh, Bahji, the mansion in, in, in Israel, as our Qibla, as our point of adoration, because like the angels in the case of Adam, we are obeying the command of God. Now, if we focus on the material uh, aspects of the Kaaba itself, there is a quote that we actually have from Baha'u'llah on the summons of Lord of Hosts. 
Thus have we built the temple with the hands of power and might. Could ye but know it. This is the temple promised unto you in the book. Draw ye nigh unto it. This is that which profiteth you, could ye but comprehend it. Be fair, O peoples of the earth, which is preferable, this or a temple which is built of clay. Set your faces towards it. Thus have ye been commanded by God to help in peril the self-subsisting. Follow ye his bidding, and praise ye God your Lord for that which he hath bestowed upon you. He verily is the truth. No God is there but he. He revealeth what he pleaseth. Through his words be, and it is. So in quick summary, in this quote from the Psalms of Lord Host, Baha'u'llah is saying, Which would you prefer? This temple created by the command of God, the receptacle of revelation? Or a point of adoration made of stone? What is he referencing here? the Qibla of the Islamic world. I believe this text is directly addressing the issue of the point of adoration being the Prophet Muhammad. Because the question here isn't whether or not Baha'u'llah has decreed his shrine as the point of adoration for the Baha'i world. It's whether or not Baha'u'llah is a messenger of God. It's a completely different question. Why? Because we know, according to the Quran, in multiple places we are told that God himself commanded a prophet to be the point of adoration for all of the angelic hosts. Those, or the one who refused to actually abide by this injunction of the divine, was himself seen as the father of lies. He, through his own arrogance, despite having been commanded by God, refused to actually bow down before Adam. This here really is the, the, the crux of it. It's whether or not Baha'u'llah is a true messenger. A topic that, given what we've seen in the Quran, given what is said about the testing of his servants, given the former changing of the Qibla, and the actual event in the Quran of a prophet of God being made a point of adoration, we cannot say that God cannot do this again, that his hands are chained up and he could not perform it once more. It is simply whether or not Baha'u'llah is a messenger of God. And this concern cannot be made an objection against the claim of Baha'u'llah, because it is very foreseeable or conceivable, if you will, that God has again ordained, instead of a qibla or a point of adoration being a box of stone, he has made it the footstool, if you will, of his revelation unto humankind in the person of the Promised One of Islam. This is why um, the Bab says, O people of the earth, to attain the ultimate retreat in God the True One, are we to seek a gate other than this exalted being? When God created the remembrance, he presented him to the assemblage of all created beings upon the altar of his will. Thereupon the concourse of the angels bowed low in adoration to God the peerless, the incomparable, while Satan waxed proud, refusing to submit to his remembrance. Hence he is identified in the book of God as the arrogant one and the accursed. In this passage the Bab is saying, are we to seek a gate other than this gate? The Bab himself. And that when God created the remembrance, a title for the manifestation of God in Christianity, the Logos. He presented him, Adam the prophet, the voice of God himself unto creation, and they were commanded to bow low. The Bab is stating that this is he himself manifested again, and this passed unto Baha'u'llah. So he is asking the world, will you be like Iblis? That if God has commanded, and his revelation has been revealed for the person of Baha'u'llah and the Bab, will you then deny his command and claim that he is but clay? So in final summary, obviously the Kaaba itself, or Jerusalem for that point, 
were symbolic of the footstool of God, symbolic of his revelation unto humankind. That's why in earlier quotes from the Quran we see that whether it be of the east or the west, it does not matter, but that God has singled out places as remembrances of his revelation. Just as the Kaaba is symbolic, just as Jerusalem was symbolic, so too is the person of the Bab and then Baha'u'llah. Secondly, the point is brought up, obviously God could do this again. Thou shalt see no change in his ways. Can we actually say that he would never do this again? Of course not. Another issue was, isn't it better then, given that we have moved from clay to actually that which can know and worship and love God, that isn't in some sense this actually an elevation of the Qibla? For Satan himself could not claim he is mere clay. And finally, we have an example from the past <laughs> of actually Adam being the point of a prayerful adoration and prostration of all the angelic hosts. So if someone has an issue with a prophetic figure being the point of adoration for humanity, he would have to take this up with the Quran. And to hold to it uh, dogmatically would to be a bliss.